Can you have a design career where you spend the bulk of your time just doing the activities that you want to do? Just doing research, just reading, just drawing, just making cool stuff. The conventional wisdom is that you can't. But in this video, I'm going to show you examples of designers that show that you can build a career doing work that you love to do in the way that you want to do it. What's up? This is MBA Joshua. Today we're going to look at Peter Saville, most famous for the Joy Division covers in the late 70s and later to be a massive influence throughout the 80s into now, really, and non-format a set of two designers who basically set trends every couple years. These designers are massively influential for the way their work looks, but what I think is really important is the way that they make the work and how that can offer you a model to conduct your career in a way that is at odds with the bulk of the industry and probably how you were taught to do it. No talk about appropriateness or blah, blah, blah. In the second part of this video, I'm gonna share a kind of impromptu talk to some of my students, talking about this idea of when the way that you wanna work seems at odds with the environment you're in. I wanted to show some work that was graphic design work that was really about image making. But as I was doing it, I ended up really pulling examples from three people because a certain thread came up in doing it. I'm also really interested in the idea that graphic design is almost not a thing. It's almost non-existent. It's this constellation of activities. So I can do a graphic design project and I can only use typography. And the approach that I take makes it graphic design. And somebody else can do graphic design projects by virtue of just using paint and paintbrushes. That the context they do things in is communications oriented and maybe mass produced on some level, but that they can do it in a way using the materials and the workflow that makes sense for them that there isn't this one size fits all thing of like, oh, graphic design is logos or it's websites or it's big iconic ideas, that there's all these different avenues. Basically, any graphic design project is like the intersection of a bunch of different disciplines, art direction, photography, layout, typography, illustration, potentially, filmmaking, potentially, all this different stuff, and that you use the bits and pieces that makes sense at that specific moment. So I just wanna briefly talk about two sets of designers and their approach that is both completely reasonable and yet highly novel. Like no one else really works like these designers. So the first one is Peter Saville. Whether you know who Peter Saville is or whether you've heard Joy Division, it is almost certain that just being in the, um, 21st century and having access to a screen, you've seen his artwork for the Joy Division Unknown Pleasures LP. So this is from 1978. And if you haven't seen it, you've seen a parody of it. Just Googling this today, like the number of parodies is uh, mind blowing. So what's interesting about this sleeve, and there's a couple of things that I think that are like kind of worth touching on. One in 1978 is a shocking move to have a record cover without the artist's name on the cover. Uh, it's so shocking, it actually sold records. Like the story goes that Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth bought the record because he's flipping, stops, and it's like, what is this thing? And then buys it. Because like, you have to be good if you don't put your name on the record. But one of the things that's interesting is like this image, which is um, kind of light diagram of the death of a star. He didn't make the image. He used what's called a stat camera to take a photo of it, to make it, be able to work for artwork in 1978, the band just gave him a folder of stuff. And there's a couple things that are interesting about that. The first one is that his ego, he just stuffed it down so far. If you've ever seen an interview with Peter Saville, he's an egomaniac, but like not when it comes to the work. So the band handed him this stuff. He didn't go, oh, I'm not doing this. Like I'm not just using this crap you handed me he immediately set about figuring out how to make it work. 
And the joke is that he didn't know how to make the art black on white, which I think is a lie, and that he didn't know how to scale it up or down. Uh, I think that's also a lie. I think he's just being self-deprecating. He had the sense to like look at this thing and be like, this thing is going to work best when it is tiny and mysterious, not when it is big. And then he kept the name of the band off because he said, where are you going to put it? It ruins the image if you put the band's name on the front. So he made this box on the back that's the exact same size. This is Joy Division, Unknown Pleasures, and that's it. These couple of little moves. So it's artwork that's not even his. He didn't even pick it because of those things that he did with it. Without creative control, he made one of the most iconic record covers in history. But that approach of using other images is a thing that he ended up running with. So this is a Joy Division single for Love Will Tear Us Apart. He's got the songs at the name of the record. And then he is a voracious consumer of images. So he found this image to use for the cover. So, I mean, the concept is like, there's this sculpture and the sculpture is perfect. It wasn't, oh, I've got this idea and I need to find this, I need to make a sculpture or whatever. It's literally like, just looking for stuff and then being like that thing, that is the thing that is perfect. And then just this type that is beautiful and elegant and does the trick. And then this weird sense that he has for using rule lines that are just, they make the thing sophisticated. But what's like the design decision is literally like, oh, that's the picture. This is the artwork for their album, Closer. Again, he just saw this image somewhere and showed it to the band and the label. It was like, this is, the, this is the cover of the record. And everyone was like, yes, it is the cover of the record. And th- the idea of the happy accident, because he's this voracious consumer of art and imagery, one has this massive backlog of stuff. Like, so that when something comes up, there's a place for it to connect to. But then it also means that um, there's like this feedback loop. Like when you need an idea, the idea is there. He just sampled this type, this image, and we're done. And that's a thread that continued through his work for a long time so another joy division single just a photograph of a field with these trees and i think the other thing that's pretty amazing is that because he was so precise and deliberate with essentially this idea of sampling things from history it also meant that he had a lot of breathing room to explore other stuff so this record like what you're seeing there that's the grain of the paper. It's printed on a textured gray paper. So he had this like kind of free space because the decision making has gotten so minimal that then it's like he thinks about stuff that a lot of other people don't give themselves time to think about because they have to come up with an idea. But the idea was just like, oh, that picture. Then it can be like, okay, how can we amplify that? What about the paper? And there's one more example. You can see in here the texture. It's essentially like linen, or it's like you're a painter, watercolor paper essentially has the same texture. This is really unusual. Like if anyone's like a record collector or whatever, everything is printed on the same crappy materials. But Peter Saville is sitting there, and because again, like his decision making is so minimal, that then he does stuff that is like, it shouldn't be shocking to use an interesting paper, but it is. But the other thing is he doesn't lean on the paper. The strength of those images is like the thing that does it. And again, the idea of all this time spending it, spent looking at images, these aren't art images. These are images from the world of science. So it's not just like he's looking at photographs of Renaissance tombs. He's looking at like everything. There's another one, orchestral maneuvers in the dark. It's just beautiful American landscape. Martha and the Muffins, Suburban Dream. This distorted, artful photo of somebody in the pool. And I mean, imagine like the design process is literally just find the right image and then everything else is easy. He did make images too. He had a tendency because of that voracious research of just looking at all this stuff, he made really legit looking images because he knew who shot what. So when he wants to get a look, he goes and finds the person that does that thing. He doesn't do, for example, oh, I want to get this kind of look. Let's see if we can hack it together. He makes the client give him the money to go find the person that does the thing. And one thing that's interesting about this one is 
So you have the photo shoot that generates these images and this is the LP cover. So like the technique is this kind of chopped up, almost cubist representation. And then all the singles are just photos from that same photo shoot. So that he has a design system happening as well. The other one is this group non-format, which is two people. Non-format are interesting because they work in a way that is unlike any graphic designer I've ever heard of. What they do is completely novel. So this is a test image. So it's an unpublished piece of work where they were exploring an idea. And this kind of goes along with a question that Jeremy asked about, when do you bring your own image making into your work? So this is a test image. This is a full view of a similar image. So they essentially were exploring this idea of typography and these kind of clouds and paint and whatnot. Here is another one. So these are fashion tests that they were calling liquid. So what non-format does that's so different and so interesting is that um, they come up with these looks for things. And some of them, like if you go to their website, you'll see stuff where if you don't recognize the thing they did, you'll recognize all the times you saw it knocked off. They go through this process of actively developing aesthetics. And they don't develop them for clients. They develop them for themselves. And then they basically tell the clients, this is what we're doing now. And they do that for 10 months to a year and a half. And during that time, they're developing the next set of aesthetics. So essentially, they're like Picasso's blue period, but they're a commercial graphic design firm who shape their work and then tell Nike, oh, this is the way the work looks now. So hopefully you like it because this is what we're doing. And they produce tons of this stuff and they keep 90% of it secret. Their book that they published probably 10 years ago now, half of it is unpublished work that they never showed anyone until they made the book of just these tests of making their own fonts and doing photo shoots and exploring all this stuff. So like before they ever did fashion, they were doing fashion photo shoots years before. And what's interesting to me, and this is the part that I think is relevant to the question Jeremy asked, is they, one, didn't wait for anyone so that they had to learn on their dime. They learned on their own. But then the other thing is they didn't do what people typically do, which is they go, okay, we got to get into fashion. So they hire like a photographer they know, and maybe they hire some people that may or may not be real models. And then they attempt to make stereotypical fashion. They attempt to make what they've seen, whereas non-format go, okay, if we were to do fashion, what would it look like? And then they go and do their own thing. And then by virtue of doing that, they make an actual contribution. And when they get work, They're not getting low level chasing what's already happened work. They get a real gig like French Vogue or something like that. Like they get a serious gig. They don't get doing the art direction for the signage in Target, which needs to be very mass market, slightly uh, ahead of a trend, but not so far that it's unfamiliar. They do themselves and then that's their thing. And I just pulled up one kind of example of this because they've been doing this now for whenever they started doing this, probably 2008 or something is when they stopped being a normal graphic design firm and started doing whatever it is they do. So this is um, a record package for Ocean Moon for their World of Light LP. So that's the front cover. It's got this crazy custom font and this kind of insane image making technique. You open it up, what is this kind of abstract font that says world of light. And then the back cover is this more of that kind of distorted imagery, kind of gradient thing. Very beautiful. This is the project they did right before it. Now in this instance, it's at its most extreme because it's for the same client, but it was not a series. Okay, I gotta stop you right here. I'm about to give you misinformation in this video. The project that I'm about to show here actually is a series. Uh, I didn't realize it until I managed to read some of the fine print on the back cover of these projects, but uh, go check out Nonformat's work and I think you will see why I actually just thought it was a really extreme version 
of the thing that they normally do. So I apologize for the misinformation, but the larger points will still hold. And this is going to go into a bit of a discussion about the real lessons that you can pull from this stuff. This is JQ outside LP. Literally the exact same thing. And in their portfolio, there's like four of these. Now, th this is the most extreme version of it because it's for one client that they've been working with forever. But if you go dig through their website, you'll see a grid of record covers and you can see like the chunk where it's like, oh, that's when they were doing these types of fonts with this type of image making. And at the same time, they did a Nike thing. And it looks just, I mean, it's, there's a margin of difference, but it's not, um, there's a thing that graphic designers often say, which is, well, you know, every client gets a unique thing. We, we never recycle work. And what they say is like, they always recycle work because it takes so long to make these new aesthetic contributions they can't afford to not recycle the work. Like they would go broke if every time a client didn't like something, if they just threw it in the drawer. They're like, oh, no, no, no. Okay, fine. You don't like it. Pay us the kill fee. But this thing is getting reused for Nike or for whatever. And the thing that I think is really important about both of these is that these are designers working in exactly the way that they want to be working not working in the way that's dictated by whether it be a super narrow chunk of the population, like say ad agencies, or by the way that design teachers think that they should be working, or um, sort of barely by the history of the medium. Because of that, I'd say they produce a massive amount of work. Because when you get to do exactly what you want to do in the way that fills you with like the most energy and the most kind of joy, you make a lot more work. You don't meet happy people that don't get anything done unless they're happy not getting stuff done. But like creative people that are productive tend to be feeling really good about the stuff that they're making. And one of the things that I think is amazing about a graphic design is that you can look at how you want to be spending your time and then you can figure out like okay there's an avenue for this like if you think about peter saville this is a person who probably wants to spend the bulk of their time flipping through books and then someone like non-format probably the bulk of how they want to be spending time is going what if we do this and one of the things that gets missed a lot like that gets missed with non-format is oh I should make a font like this, but they didn't always make fonts like this and they'll stop making fonts like this. The thing to take from non-format is, oh, I can carve out a lane and I can do my work and run my studio in a way that's unlike what everyone else does. And I think that that's magical and I think it's understated and underutilized. You know, it's like pretty amazing to me. It's like, um, Normally, what you would tell someone, if what they wanted to do was spend 10% of their time designing and 90% of their time in the library, you would be like, no one's going to pay you to do that. It's never going to work. But it's just, there's context you can't do that in. So if you're doing a certain kind of work, like say you do that collage that we did, and something about that, even if the results weren't good yet, but something about the process just felt right. If it sparked something, to me, that's a really important sign that you go like, I should be doing more of this. Now, just because you want to do more of it doesn't mean that it's going to work for the people you currently work for. But it might be a really good sign of, I should be doing more of this at night, or I really need to set up my life so that I stop working for these people and I start working for the people that are going to let me start every project with a collage or the people that are going to understand that what I do is look for historical parallels. So I look at this thing, and I try to understand it, and then I go to the library, and I look for the thing from 1476 that is the right image for it. And on paper, that sounds ridiculous, but in practice, it's completely doable. It's just no one does it. So those are just two examples of designers that use or make images 
in a way that's pretty much unlike the rest of the design industry, but there's nothing unreasonable about the approach. So as you're making stuff and finding out what things interest you, look for the examples of it that show you the possibilities, not the walls and the handcuffs and the, oh, this is supposed to be done this particular way. Look for the things where you go like, oh, weird. I could put a drawing in every single project if I chose to. I just have to find the people that will run with that particular program of mine. So that was Peter Savile in non-format. I hope that you dug that. I hope that you find some inspiration in ways that you can conduct your career. This next part is just an impromptu lecture given to my students. We're working in a kind of experimental method and I wanted to make sure that they understood that if they saw value in it, they can take that into their career. It doesn't have to be this stupid idea that school is a place to experiment and a career is a place to basically die slowly. This process that we're doing, right now it's, the results are really rich, it's really fun to do, it's fairly experimental. In general, you can't go to pretty much anyone and run this process. You could run it with a client, but you pretty much can't run it with a boss. They're gonna be confused by the steps. They're gonna be confused by the idea that you're gonna start something without knowing where it's gonna end up. A lot of people respect sketching, but they're not gonna respect this weird process where you're like, I don't really know where I'll end up. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing is like, if you take the process from the last time we had a class together, which was like kind of a more traditional design process, except that it's really, it was really granular. Now, part of it's granular, so we only do one thing at a time, but part of it is also granular to make sure that we really dig into every step of the process. But what's the fastest you could realistically do that process? Even a month, I would argue. Like, you need time to let that kind of process unfold. You need time to research and so on and so forth. Whereas the process we're doing right here, you could actually probably do in a week and get results, you know? Day and a half of one thing, day and a half of the next, day and a half of the image making, pile it all together. You could pull something together in a week. You could pull, the other thing is you wouldn't just pull one thing together. You'd probably pull together like 30 posters. So that process, you also kind of can't do with a boss. The professional world of design by and large tends to treat everything as, well, research is nice, sketching is nice. These are all nice to haves. They're not part of the, the real activity. The normal way to approach this then is to say, well, this is school. We get to work in an idealized fashion and we get to give a fuck about process and we get to take our time doing it. And what I want you to think about is kind of two things. One is, the point is not to have any of you run this process now as your own from here on out. The point is to break it up into small enough steps that you can steal the bits that are working for you or that you can take the whole thing and build on top of it. Same with last semester. It's broken up into those discrete steps, not because it's the right way to do it, but so that you can go like, that piece works for me, whatever that piece was, whether it was bed no diagrams or just doing more research or sketching. But the idea is that like, by breaking it down, you can figure out what ingredients jive with the way that you're wired so that you can do the right work for you. But then point two is to think about this. The idea that if this process is working, if it worked straight through, and then we just chalked it up to, oh, that was a cool thing I got to do in school, and then let's go and have a, whatever, 20, 30, 40, 50 year career, and you just can't do that ever again, because that doesn't fit with someone else's way of running their business. That part's really crazy. And that's where I would say, like, as you're figuring out the parts of a process that work for you, when you start to get into jobs where they try to cram you into another process, you don't wanna be changing. And it sounds like negative, I don't really mean it that way, but like some people work super fast. Like I tend to work really, really fast. Other people like they're very methodical and painstaking. 
I haven't left a lot of room for that because we're trying to do a different thing. But the point is never that that's wrong. But like I know people that the feedback they get is like, you need to work faster, you need to work faster, or you need to slow down, or you need to think in systems, like whatever it is. And the fact is, if you're getting that feedback repeatedly, you do not need to work faster, you don't need to think in systems, you don't need to be conceptual, you don't need to be non-conceptual, you need a new job. It's one thing if you have a way you wanna work and you can work in their way and it's going smoothly. But if you have a way you wanna work and on top of that, the way that you're being like forced to work by whoever's signing your checks sucks, don't stick around for that stuff or start to plan an exit so that you can be working in a way that is like works for you and the way that you're wired. The whole reason I think you need to have outside practices is so that when you're working on the client stuff, you can still do right by the client. When they ruin it, as they often will do, because that's what happens, having that outside stuff is what helps give you like a necessary distance between you and that piece of work so that they're not ruining your life's work. They're just ruining the thing you worked on for the last week and fuck it, it's their prerogative. But that's a lot different than like, you can have a perfect process and still have clients ruin stuff because you're dealing with other human beings. But the big thing is that when people are making you feel like you need to change how you're working, that's a situation that you don't wanna be in. And that's one of the things that I've never like met for a job interview or a contract gig or anything, anyone who's ever asked me, how is it that I work? Or told me how it is that they work. It's always been like this mystery that you discover when you get there. Maybe that means everybody works the same, or maybe it just means that like everybody is busy being annoyed that this person works too slow. That person is frustrated that they can't work faster, that they can't deliver results faster. But the reality is like, it's just a, a mismatch. It's got nothing to do with the clients. It's got solely to do with the person that you're working for. And like, I can say from experience, like I just made sure Latitude didn't know what my process was because I knew that the way I worked didn't jive with what was like what they were telling people that they did. And I was just like, cool, I'm just gonna hide the first week's worth of stuff from you every week. And that way I get to do the shit that I need to do in order to do a good job. And you can run around thinking that it's like about fucking innovative thinking or whatever like shit that they thought it was about. And I got to do good work. So that was like, it was fine. As long as everyone left me alone, I could get results. But if if they were actually came in and were like, you can't do this. I mean, I would have been miserable and frustrated. And then everyone would have complained about me like, well, you're really gonna have to get results faster and blah, 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 blah. And that would be a bad fit. As you're going forward, like think about what stuff you really need to have in place as you're working. And like when you're interviewing places, like try to get a feel for what they're about or if they're gonna be open to you being about what you're about. Because a lot of places will see the portfolio and think that they're on your program until they have to work with you. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, 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 no. We need you to do this, this, and this. And like, we don't do versions. We do one thing, which is like how a lot of places, like that's their philosophy. Like, no, we just do one. Start to kind of mull this over of like what kind of place you wanna work, what kind of career you wanna have. And the other thing is if you haven't defined what that dream job is yet, just do it. Like you can do it in the car just by talking out loud. Like, this is what I want. This is the situation I want. That might change in a year, two years, five years. But if you know what you want right now, at least you can start to plan towards that and you can always adjust course later. But what you don't want to be is one of those people that's getting drilled into the ground by a fucking shitty job. Because everyone around them is like, no, that's a great job. Like you're so lucky to work there. Except that like they're lucky to work there. It sucks for you. School can do the same thing. Some people can't handle the big school project. And so the message that they get is like, you need to be able to focus or you need to be able to work on multi-week projects or you need to be able to think in systems. And the reality is like, no, that person needs to just be doing different types of projects or drop out of school as the case may be. But none of that is, a, is really a, 
adequate commentary about what that person is capable of. Um, so the big thing is like, I don't want you to think that, oh, it's school. We get to work in this idealized version. Like I'm trying to give you as much in terms of process, realistic shit that you can use. But then there is this thing that if it works for you, you then have to ensure that you get to act on it and not that you got to spend the next however many decades being like, man, school was really cool. I really wish I could work like that. It sucks that I got to like do whatever dumb shit I got to do. A thing to think about. In the next episode of the vlog, we're going to talk about the role of play as a form of research and how it helps you figure out what your personal creative process is about. Here's a clip. The big difference between how I would do that kind of thing now and how I would have done that years ago is that years ago I would have had a really specific image in my head and then it wouldn't have felt like play it would have felt like work because I'm trying to construct this thing and on top of that I was probably gonna fail because that image in your head so rarely comes to fruition. 